We're all dependent on like physical things, whether that be water or food. Yeah. But I feel like humans as a social creature, yeah. I think the next evolutionary step yeah. is to become social Darwinists. Darwinists, so, social Darwinists. Social Darwinists. Yeah. And meaning, uh, you know, uh, surviving and survival of the fittest. Of the yeah. fittest and surviving in terms of like um, the good. Uh, and has that some ca capitalistic aspects as well to it? Uh, the, the church doesn't dive into politics. Politics. Really, no. Okay. But, um, so that's quite interesting. Yeah. It's not politics, no. but it's also not metaphysical, spiritual stuff. So what is it then? It's a philosophy, the same as uh, Taoism, for example. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah but what, what, what's your 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 take sort of like on the contingency argument? This idea that you know there is a dependency, a chain of dependency that goes back. Um, uh, would you agree with me if I said the argument's first premise is everything has a cause? Yeah. yeah. It seems, uh, yeah, yeah, that's the premise, yeah, I would say so. Okay. So, you know, energy in general yeah. doesn't have a cause. Yeah. Yeah. So, if we're looking at it from a purely scientific lens, yeah. you look at thermodynamics, yeah. the first law especially, yeah. energy cannot be created nor destroyed, yeah. meaning it's eternal, right? Yeah. So, the first premise of the Kalam is... Yeah. But then, is it not energy in a closed system? Because uh, the, the universe seems to be... Uh, Ex at least from the observable things that we can see that it's a closed system. Yeah, so it's energy because it was transferred into the closed system. Yeah. But I forget the scientist's name, you can look yeah. it up or whatever, but yeah. it's a thing called the BGV theorem. Okay. Which states that there has to be somethingness outside of the space-time boundary. Yeah. In order to, for, for us to expand into Yeah, absolutely. It's like, you know when you get a sink? Yeah. You pour water into it and the water goes like that. Yeah. There needs to be something for it to expand yes. into. Yes, so right? to hold the water. To hold the water. Yeah. I mean, again, just based upon the things that we can see and the things that we can theorize, it seems to be that there was something uh, at the beginning that yeah. had an, an explosion of, of, of um, expansionism that takes place in the universe. And I think people would maybe perhaps call this the first cause for us from, from the perspective of humans. Um, but like... I mean, I like. I think it's a very strong argument, but but I'm. I also like to like humanize the argument a bit more because I think we we're talking about very highly complex um, and very abstract ideas. You know, um, there's a lot of logic involved in this. You know, and there's a lot of like theory involved in yeah. this. In, in fact, as well. Um, yeah, yeah. But I'm very interested. I'm very interested in the idea of like. The sense that we humans have that we wanted to fulfill, that sense of filling a void with something, you know, with a philosophy, with an idea. Why is it that we humans are like that? Why is it that we're so advanced? You know, we, we are at the brink of, 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 of facing and this, uh, what was it called, the destruction by AI and algorithms. And we are still here trying to, um, so many um, thousands of years later, trying to figure out this idea of like, you know, and I think this is because natural. There's something within us that is so deeply rooted. Because I think there's a lot of things that we've been able to like kind of brush off with, with time, with, with the passage of time, with the development of technology. We've been able to brush off a lot of these um, things that were sometimes even harmful. For example, the majority of people do not sacrifice their children any longer to sun gods. So, do you know I mean, like we've we've realized that that doesn't really help. You know. Um, but fundamentally, this idea of like, where am I from? What is the self? Where am I going when I'm dying? Why is this that? Why are there so many people who believe that there's something outside of the basin or the sink that you're talking about, that like the ground of all being that kind of upholds everything that we we engage in? I think humans need to believe in a god. Yeah. As much as dogs need an owner. So, do you, dogs, have you, have you ever, I mean in this country not, but stray dogs, stray dogs they yeah. do exist. They do exist, but I think their natural tendencies is yeah. to be, you know, yeah. uh, have a human to rely on to give them food for example. Yeah. But I just think many people are scared of death, yeah. which is why they want to believe that there's yeah. something after it. Yeah. But I've come to a position where yeah. death is no longer feared yeah. and it's welcomed. 
in a sense of when you die, nothing is gonna matter. So, but then would you would you not say that that could also be sort of a bit of a cop out to like just use use euphemism, euphemism euphemisms to make the departure less worrying because so nice right yeah. because then there's also people who actually welcome death also with a positive belief in God because they're like well I can't wait to meet God yeah right. Uh, well, sorry to interrupt you. If you're no, 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 no. I was I think Anton put it best. Yeah. When he said the Satanist is a lover of life, as death is the eternal disembowelment of life. Okay. So I want to. Yeah. The reason I don't kill myself. Yeah. To put it in broad senses, is because nothing is going to happen to me when I die. Okay. And this is the only plane of existence. Yeah. In which I can, you know, be subjectively happy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but then, but then, does that not speak against? So like, but then, but it doesn't exactly prevent people from suiciding or committing suicide either. And I don't, I don't think you, you, there may, may not be an op, um, opinion on that, right? Um, a, a moral, at least, a philosophical opinion to prevent someone from dying, since life is you should enjoy life. Yeah. But like, well, how would a Satanist then prevent someone from... Prevent suicide. Yeah. <clears throat> well, um, so suicide's a very uh, subjective mindset. Okay. Obviously, I wouldn't do it myself. Yeah. I've known people who have done it, unfortunately. Wow. Um, yeah, but yeah. I guess it's in a sense of Anton does say, as long as you don't harm yourself intentionally, then it's okay what you do. Because he speaks about tattoos and stuff. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. In Marilyn Manson's biography, yeah. he had a conversation with Anton where Anton talked about his tattoos and stuff, and he said a Satanist should be able to express themselves with art form the same as a Christian can express themselves with a cross. Yeah. So as long as long as you're not intentionally hurting yourself, like yeah. you know, cutting yourself or yeah. like you know, then. But then, the question begs is that. Um, well, but if you die and nothing happens anyway, if there's no consequences, then why not do that? Well, because... Yeah. Yes. Uh, I like to analogize it like yeah. uh, Zena levated. Now, I'd like to point out Zena is no longer part of the church, so her opinion doesn't hold okay. any weight. Okay. But she said in an interview, she says, the same reason I'm living my life is the same reason I'm watching a good movie. Okay. It's because I know the movie's going to end. Yeah. But I'm gonna enjoy it whilst I'm here. Okay. You know what I mean? Yeah. But I, you know, I, I find this is it's actually quite poetic, um, that that statement. But I find perhaps that the reason behind that is is that thing that um, some philosophers uh, like Schopenhauer talk about as well, and he's very grim. But like they talk about the will to live, the will, the will, the, this penetrative thing that is the foundation of life. This thing to constantly want to procreate this thing to like live you this thing something that is almost outside of us that drives this this circus right because like for a lot of people life is very very grim but it still doesn't push them to the point of like um, um suicide in fact um early and this is might be a bit update um outdated but very early um studies on suicide and uh, Emil Durkheim is one of the, the famous ones uh, on suicide he um, and this is so, sort of like just after I don't know what world war it was it was maybe one or it was probably one so I don't think he was alive in the second world war but he found out that um, in fact suicide rates go down when there's wars yeah. and they kind of go up when people live domestic lives and it's to do with this idea or like people in poorer places tend to commit less suicide than people in more developed countries um, and it is very similar um, in Europe as well if you look at the suicide rates that the Scandinavian countries seem to be the leading countries but like materially they perform quite well you know it's very socialist um, inspired governments and um, govern programs and right to leave for both male and female and all these things to make life a tiny bit more easier yeah. um, so I think there is something 
that when someone puts your head down underwater, you're trying to yeah, breathe, instinct. right? Yeah, these instincts. But it, I think it's also, it goes beyond instincts almost. I think it's to do with just human condition that, that we, we, again, if I may say, we've been created in a way to live, to, to, to want to live, and to want to continue to live, um, because there's this sense of continuity that we believe in, even though we don't even know where we were before we came, like subconsciously, you know? Um, but then again, this is just my, my humble opinion, and I'm not trying to... No, yeah, you're fine, don't worry. Yeah, trying to use... Uh, is yeah, or even like preach or anything. But yeah, these are things that I, I wonder myself, right? I wonder about these things quite a lot. And then when I have something like the Quran telling me that uh, God uh, is and hey, uh, God is life itself. That God is the ever living, you know. And 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 that human beings, what we do is we constantly emulate, um, or. When we do, when there are opportunities to emulate God, uh, God's characteristics, that like the sense of energy um, imbibes and is embedded in us, you know, um, life is precious, like they say. Um, um, yeah, so I, I I I find that the idea that you you live and you don't want to die is precisely because there's something that we believe will continue you know i don't think it's because because then the argument is always and i'm trying to think about this argument is always going to be well what's the point i mean if there's nothing absolutely nothing there because the idea a good film in fact what a good film actually does is if you watch a good film you the effect of the good film remains with you, right? That's what good art does. And, uh, and and that's why it might drive you to even watch another film by, by the same um, director, you know? I don't, I don't, maybe I misunderstood the point that uh, the lady was making, but like, I feel like what a good film does is actually, it, 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 it empowers you um, and it leaves a mark on you, you know? The, it is, it, the film never ends with the film itself. You know, and I feel like life is a bit like that as well. I don't think... You know, that, that's an important uh, thing, actually. Because I remember Zena's uh, husband, Nic yeah. Nicholas Shrek. Yeah. Again, not part of the church anymore, so... Yeah. But there's a study done by... Uh, I'm not sure who. Look it up again. Yeah. My mind's gone blank with the studies. Sure, sure. But older people, especially nearing their death, wow. turn to religion wow. way more than younger people okay and this is because like nicholas yeah. was saying he says going on to your point if you're watching a good film and then you're sitting there watching the credits you're hoping there's a lord of the rings part four right <laughs> it's quite my favorite film yeah. so that's kind of an analogy when it comes yeah. to uh, old people on their deathbed yeah. yeah they're looking back on their memories yeah. Yeah. and then they turn to religion yeah because then they're like there's more after this. I can continue living. The sequel's obviously going to be better. Yeah. And I think humans, again, are conditioned yeah. to want, to think that there's a point to life. But I mean, in reality, there isn't. Yeah, but like this condition, like it must happen a very mass scale. It must, it must happen very systematically. There must be uh, billions pumped into this. In fact, if you look at like the way life has been uh, governed for the last say 200 years 300 years yeah. um, it's never been that way you know life it's been very difficult it's only recently uh, the last 100 years that we've had uh, people having worth life to remember you know worth memories to remember uh, but I do see the idea I do see and understand what you say in terms of like people wanting to wish that there's a sequel to um, to part one, yeah. but I think honestly, I just think personally, 
um, that this is something that is um, within us. This is something that is really deeply, deeply ingrained in human beings. I agree with that point to a certain extent. Yeah. But I don't believe it's created into us. I think it's evolved into us. Evolved. Evolved into okay. us. Survival of the fittest. Yeah. Because I think, you see, that, that wishful thinking, for argument's sake, is, is, is the same force that would force you to survive as long as you can. Yeah. Uh, in, if, if, and this is a crazy story. I was I watching a video the other day on YouTube, and it was about this guy and this uh, so African uh, crew who were on the um, coast of um, the Atlantic coast of Nigeria, and uh, so there was, there was like, the, the crew had locked themselves in uh, because it was it was at night time. And there was like massive waste happening. But for someone who lives on a boat, that's, you know, it's not any different, you know. Um, and usually what they would do is they would lock themselves in, uh, in, um, in in their cabins, uh, because they, uh, that region was uh, uh, infested or with pirate piratry. There's a lot of piracy happening there. So uh, when, if there's pirates happen to be in there, they'll be safe from, from pirates. So, but there was one guy, and this is a real story, there was one guy who would get up very early because he was the chef of the crew, and he was in his boxes getting up to get the food ready because when you're on, 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 on the sea or, or anywhere, you you, um, you have to get up very early. It's the same way as a farmer has to get very up very early. And he happened to go get ready for the day, whatever, it was about 3 a.m. or something. And then the the boat capsized, cap, capsized right? Because there was like these massive waves, and um, the boat gets filled with water, and then it sinks into the ground. He, because he was awake, he realized it was happening, and he gets himself to the nearby sort of cabin. It was the uh, captain's cabin he got in, and there's some there's like the scientific thing, you know, when you have like a cup of water. You know when you like place it into water, at the top there's like air. Airport, yeah. yeah, this airport. So this airport forms in the cabin that he was in. And at this point, I mean, uh, he finds mattresses and things like that to jump on it because he would have uh, otherwise died on hypo hypothermia. That would have been the next thing that would have got him. So he, so he survives. There was there was a bottle of coke that he, he ironically. He was surviving on for like the last uh, next, yeah, yeah. <laughs> for, for uh, forty-eight hours, but he wasn't describing his um, experience, you know. And he was like, "I man, I, I, I was just trying to survive as, as long as I could, even though I knew that the the situation was dire. I was trying to survive as, as much as I could, and 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 rationality would say, well, there's no point. I'm I'm I've sunk. I'm gone." No one is gonna find me, right? I might as I might as well just give up, you know. But he didn't give up because, again, I think because if you think about it rationally, a boat that is sunk in the middle of the night, um, how many hours does he have to survive? Yeah. Why? Why you? Why you? Where's the hope coming from? I mean, it's 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 a dire situation. That hope, that belief, you know, he was praying and everything, whatever. And uh, by chance, a crew finds the, the rack. Um, I don't know if it was by chance. Maybe there was a signal that was sent to a crew to look for the ship. Um, but yeah, he survived. He survived, and he, he never gave up. And I think again, I think again, there's something outside of us. That drives us that to never despair, to never despair. And God speaks about this in the Quran. Allah says that there are people who generally don't believe in God, but then when they're stranded on the sea, they, yeah. all the sincerity, they're like, "Yo, I have, I generally never believed in you, but like, yo, like, yeah, yeah whatever, they forget about it." You know, so that this is how the Quran describes this, like, and the, the Quran describes of this, like, point of sincerity, this, like, moment of, like, absolute truth, like, you're absolutely truthful in that moment. There's no uh, bias, <clears throat> there's no motivation. You're just like, yo, I've tried everything else, 
I've tried to hiss like the white flags, it's not working, like I'm turning to you, the God of the universe, help me. You know, um, and, and I would love to like with my life, I would try, I would love to investigate that that place of sincerity. You know, when you're absolutely sincere, and, um, um, yeah. I mean, th thinking of that sincerity. Sorry, there's a guy shouting behind us, and it's kind of hard to hear. Yeah. So I have to like come closer. Yeah. But um, with that sincerity. The past couple of years have been uh, a pretty bad place for me. Yeah. So I think that when I turned to religion, yeah. I was really sincere yeah. when I did call out to God. Because yeah. I did have that moment when I was like, you know, yeah. and all that. And I believe in my heart that I genuinely believe that. Yeah. It was not. Just, it was not until I buckled down and anchored myself to education that I firstly I stopped believing in the Bible yeah because I was just a theist when I stopped believing in the Bible but it wasn't until I anchored down and learned about everything that I fully became an atheist yeah. and this is actually uh, talked about not the sincerity part, but yeah. the education yeah. bit yeah. in the satanic Bible yeah. it's in the satanic sins it says the first sin the most outrageous sin is stupidity is people being like insincere yeah. just stupid because yeah. obviously around the park especially yeah. you get people like this guy i'm not calling him stupid yeah. but if you ask him why jesus is true he'll just say because he is believe yeah whilst if i ask you why allah is true yeah. you'll have like a proper you know discourse yeah. with you. Yeah. But that's yeah. why it's a sin. Yeah. It's Stupidity is a sin, and you know what? I think that there's one thing that I do will agree with the Satanists with. That it is, it is, it is. To and Allah speaks about this. Allah speaks about the differences of, of, of the servant. Is the uh, this, this the stupid servant as useful to his master than the, the more uh, inclined uh, uh, servant? No, there's not. And, and, and it is uh, something encouraged to to be. Thinking about things and thinking about the right things, most importantly, you know. Um, but um, yeah, I find like again, I think with yourself, and honestly, um, the reason why I wanted to have this conversation in the first place because I felt very warm around you, and I felt very that you're you, you were very sincere. I mean, one of the things that you said, which really touched me, that you wanted to apologize to Ali. Um, I think. That, that shows character, you know, that you're willing to, I don't know what you wanted to apologize for exactly, but like you had time to think about this and this shows me that you're a very thoughtful person. Um, well, if I just, just uh, quickly, I just want to put out an actual sincere apology to anyone, yeah. especially Muslim, who's watching this video, because yeah. there's clips, I'm not sure if it's on Ali's channel. Yeah. But when I was Christian, debating on uh, the Aisha marriage, yeah. I would like to, um, even if you guys don't believe me or whatever, I'm being very sincere. I believe you, I believe you, I really do. I want to take back my words there and say a sincere apology to you, yeah. Ali and all the Muslims, for calling Muhammad the heinous names that I did. Thank you. I think what made my mind think that was being around everyone else who was just yeah. kind of... Yeah. Saying all that and being like, yeah. oh look, she was six, she was yeah. nine. Yeah. But yeah, now I'm looking at it and looking yeah. at it in, you know, I yeah. still don't think it's right personally. Yeah. But I'm not going to condemn him from doing that because yeah. obviously yeah. different time and all that. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, just want to say I, sorry. I to appreciate him. you, John. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think, yeah, I think it's quite interesting. One thing as well I, I really have to mention was that um, what I did ask you about, like, what kind of attracted you to Christianity. You did say that, at, at least at that time, it, it, it seemed, um, and I, I'm not saying it doesn't seem like that any longer, but like, 